Hello everyone, Michael here for Tactic Imperialis. Welcome to episode 3 of Codex Analysis Skintari. Today we're going to take a look at the vehicles for the Skintari. There's only three of them. Um, in the last episode we covered all the infantry units, which are your troops and your elite slots. There'll be a link in the description to the Adeptus Mechanicus players so you can go and check them out. Uh, if you have missed those episodes, there. Yeah. If you have missed those last episodes, I do recommend you give them a watch because we covered the entire war gear list in the last episode, with a, the exception of a few things which we're going to obviously cover today. So, let's just quickly recap what we had before. With our Skitari infantry, we have some pretty useful but often quite expensive units, particularly in the case of infiltrators and rust stalkers. Uh, our troops are useful, the guns are pretty good, but you do have a bit of a range issue. Anti-vehicle, not an issue. You have quite a bit of anti-tanks, but we'll, we'll talk about that at the end of the next episode when we do formations and then final review. So, today we're going to cover the Sidonian Dragoons, the Iron Strider Ballastari, and the Onega Dune Crawler. Um, I'm going to try and keep my voice down a bit in this episode. I got a bit loud last time and uh, I got a bit of a noise warning, so I'm going to try and keep my voice down for my flatmate's benefit. Right, so, Sidonian Dragoons, 45 points each for weapon skill, ballistic skill 4, strength 5, armor 11, 11, 11. Initiative 3, 3 attacks, 2 hull points. Not bad. It's an open topped walker, so it's pretty easy to kill. Um, and it's armed with a searchlight, a broad spectrum data tether, and a taser lance. Searchlights work the way they always have done. I think the main thing with searchlights is actually remember, remembering to use them, because I never did. Uh, so, taser lance. We talked about the taser goad in the last episode, but the taser lance is slightly different. So, it has two profiles. Um, for its strength base, it's a melee weapon with taser, which means that when it attacks, if it rolls a hit to uh, a six to hit, you get two additional hits, which is pretty nice. And it gets plus three strength on the turn it charges, plus two strength otherwise, which means that you've got the strength eight on the turn you charge, strength seven otherwise, but you are still on the AP nothing. It also has the joust special rule. Um, when you uh, charge that turn that you make a successful charge, you get double initiative. Which means that you go up to initiative six. Uh, you'll still have four attacks, but you'll be initiative six, and you'll be strength eight on the charge. Initiative three and strength five, after, strength seven afterwards. That's not bad. I mean, it's not the most amazing weapon in the world, but it'll hit pretty hard, and if you can get a fair few hits off of Taser by combining them into a unit, you could do some damage. The broad spectrum data tether. Uh, all models of friendly units with the Skitari factor within 6 inches of at least one model with a broad spectrum data tether infected, that are affected by a Doctrina imperative add plus one to their leadership until the start of your next term. This is not cumulative with the enhanced data tether which we talked about is available for um, Rangers and Vanguard in the last episode. So if you're running a fair few of these Sedonian Dragoons you definitely don't need to invest in enhanced data tethers because these guys give you the plus one leadership anyway and they don't stack. Um, do any of the other vehicles have that data tether? I just want to check while I'm here. The dune crawlers have it. Actually, yeah, all the vehicles have it. So if you're running a vehicle heavy Skitari army, you don't need enhanced data tethers because they're all got all the vehicles have broad spectrum ones built in. Uh, the dragoons also have the crusader special rule, which is kind of nice and kind of fitting. Doctrina imperatives, which means that you can get them up to ridiculous weapon skill, and they don't carry guns, so they take no pen penalty from it. And they have Dune Strider, which allows them to move pretty quickly. They basically have um, a 9-inch move, a D6 plus 3-inch run, and a 2D6 plus 3-inch charge. And they also have a rule called Incense Cloud. A uh, model with this special rule has a 5 plus cover save, counting as obscured, basically. And that's really kind of useful. It means you don't have to use terrain to keep yourself alive. And in most cases, it's kind of like having a 5 plus invuln save. Because most stuff is not going to... It's not going to cr crack armor 11 that is also ignores cover. Like flamers are only strength 4, heavy flamers are strength 5, but they're only clancing on 6s. So it's basically like having a 5 plus invon save. So it's pretty good to have, and if you can get into some cover, um, you'll do pretty well for yourself. Um, I don't think it works like shrouded though. Incense cloud gives you a 5 plus cover save because you're obscured. Then standing in terrain does not, I think, add to that cover save uh, because you don't have stealth or shrouded. You may go up to 5 additional Sidonian Dragoons at 45 points per model, which gives you a full-size squad of 225 points, uh, 5, nope, sorry, 270 points for 6. That's that's cheaper than a full squad of Rust Stalkers or Infiltrators, let, let, just put that into context for you. Uh, and they'll hit pretty hard, particularly with the Taser rule, you'll be then scoring like 18 attacks on the charge, uh, you'll probably get a couple of 6s. Any model of plays its Taser Lance with a Radium Jezail, which is a gun. That's not it. 
uh, radium one. Radium Jezails are 30 inch range, strength X, AP5, heavy 2, sniper with a rad poisoning special, which we covered in the last episode. Um, if you roll a 6 to wound, you cause 2 wounds instead of 1, regardless of toughness, and each wound is allocated and saved again separately. So you wound on 4s um, and your AP5, but if you roll a 6 to wound, you get an extra wound. Which is pretty good. I mean, it's not the most ridiculous. Actually, yes, it is, because a 6 to wound is also AP2. So if you do roll any 6s, that's 2 dead guys. That's pretty good. Um, is it worth taking out the taser lances? In a game like this, with where the combat is so... Not irrelevant, but weak. I think having Jezails is actually pretty good, because they're long-ranged... Uh, that like one of the longest range guns that you have available to you with the exception of the transuranic arquebus actually I don't think anything uh, there's one or two things that outrange it but there we'll be covering them later in the episode so yeah pretty good I'm gonna say the Jezo for a free swap I think you could easily have a full squad kitted out with those guys and they'll do a fair bit of work for you and any model might also take a phosphor serpenta which is um, not going to replace any of your weapons and it costs 10 points and what it does is it's an 18 inch range, strength 5, AP4, assault 1, luminogen. So any model that suffers one or more wounds, unsaved wounds, glancing hits, or penetrating hits, counts its cover save as being one worse, and units can be rolled the dice to determine their charge range against it. This is a weapon you want to have if you are running with the lance set, because you want to be getting into combat, and this allows you to re roll your charges against the unit that you then shoot. And because of your 2d6 plus 3, you're more likely to actually be in range of getting a charge off, even if you're quite long range from the unit. It's really helpful to have that reroll. Uh, strength 5 AP4, I mean, you're only going to get a couple of hits out of it, a couple of wounds tops, but even if you get one unsaved wound through, you have just made your charge much easier. And it could also work with the Jezail set. Um, fire this first, maybe knock their cover saves down so that those sniper rounds are a little bit more effective if they're stood in cover. Uh, so yeah, Phosphorus Serpenta, pretty good thing to have on you. Uh, I'm not really going to complain about it at all, because it's good. Do you pay 10 points for it? I mean, it's basically adding 25% onto the cost of your Dragoons, but it's pretty useful. I think it'd be pretty good to have. Um, and remember, you Doctrinas, you can either go with the plus ballistic skill if you're in the Jezail set, or you can use the weapon skill buff early if you need to throw these guys in with the combat set. Right. So, Iron Strider Ballastari, these are 55 points, they cost 10 points more per model than a Dragoon. And their stats are slightly different, so their weapon skill is down a point, so their weapon skill 3. Uh, but they're still Ballistic skill 4, strength 5, armor 11 all round, initiative 3, 2 attacks, 2 hull points, exactly the same. Oh, they also have one less um, attack than the Dragoon's base, okay? So, you lose a weapon skill and an attack, and gain 10 points in cost. Um, they're still an open top walker, and they are armed with a broad spectrum data tether and searchlight, as the dragoons are. But they're also armed with a twin linked Cognis auto cannon. Why can't it just be a twin linked auto cannon? It make my life so much easier, at any rate. Cognis weapon, here we go. So a Cognis auto cannon is basically an auto cannon with an extra special rule uh, called Cognis. When a model makes snapshots, including Overwatch, with a weapon that has the rule, its ballistic skills counted as two instead of one. That's really, really good. I mean. It's not going to do that much. You go from hitting on sixes to hitting on fives, but that effectively doubles the amount of hits you're going to get on Overwatch. If you have a large squad with Cognis weapons, they're going to do quite a few hits. There are a couple of other Cognis weapons which we'll talk about a little bit later, and they would also benefit from this quite a lot. So it's not too bad. Uh, you paid 10 points over the uh, Dragoon to get that realistically and lose some stats. So you basically paid 15 points for it. Um, it's pretty good, though. You have... A, the Crusader rule, as before, Doctrina Imperatives, and Dune Strider. And you also have Precision Shots, uh, which is kind of you sort of, it's similar to if you ran the Radium Jezel set on your Dragoons, you get Precision Shot because you have Sniper. Having Precision Shots is pretty useful, although it's not that useful on the Auto Cannons, because unless you're shooting at something like Guard, um, they're going to get their saves against it, you're not going to be able to instant kill them. So I don't think it's that amazing, but it's it's still nice to have. You can include up to five additional Ballastari at 55 points a model, meaning you can have a grand total of six, sending you back 330 points, which is about the same as 10 Rust Stalkers, or Infiltrators, one or the other. And any model may replace its Twin Link Cognis Auto Cannon with a Twin Link Cognis Lads Cannon. This is basically just a Lads Cannon, but it works exactly the same way as a Cognis weapon, meaning that it is BS2 when snap firing. This is pretty good, and it's 20 points, so it takes you up to 75 points. So you have 75 points for what is in essence a slightly flimsier Space Marine Rhino. With no, sorry, bad example. 
a slightly flimsy Razorback for about, so you're paying about the same as a Razorback, but instead of having three hull points in a Rhino chassis, you become a Walker, um, you become open topped, and you gain precision shots, and you get faster. Is it a fair trade to a Razorback? I'm not sure. I mean, it gives you some fighting potential, I guess. I mean, two attacks at strength five is not terrible, so they can actually fight if absolutely necessary. But I don't think they're that amazing. Um, although, if you do need some anti-monster, I mean, anti-tank is not an issue with this book because you have a lot of paywire. But if you need anti-tank, uh, anti-light vehicles, the auto-cannon is handy, and the, and the last cannon gives you some good anti-monster, anti-heavy infantry, which aren't affected by your haywire weapons. Uh, it's quite useful in that regard. So last cannons are not good, not too bad, and the auto cannon is pretty helpful as well. If you're trying to economize, it's not going to do that badly for you. Uh, overall, do I prefer Ballastari or Dragoons? Honestly, I think Dragoons with Jezails will do a lot of work for you because they can get you some AP2, they can do extra wounds, and the Ballastari just can't. But the Ballastari have a different purpose, which is light vehicles, heavy infantry. Or medium to heavy infantry and monstrous creatures whereas the uh, dragoons are not built for that job whatsoever even with their sniper weapons it's not going to do that much for you uh, and their lances are an ap nothing on the charge they don't actually hit that hard in melee i would always run them with a um, jezels as a shooting set and now it comes to the omega dune crawlers these guys are 90 points each their weapon skill 3 ballistic skill 4 strength 5 front and side armor 12 rear 11 Initiative 2, 1 attack, and 3 hull points. So, similar sort of stats to a Space Marine Dreadnought. You pay less for it, but you lose a weapon skill, you lose a strength, you gain a rear armor, you lose a bit of initiative, and you lose some attacks. Okay, and you're also a walker still, but this is where it's so useful. You get a bunch of clever stuff. So you get an Eradication Beamer as your basic weapon, and the Eradication Beamer is kind of like the Conversion Beamer for Space Marines, except in reverse, so it gets better at closer range, whereas the conversion beam gets better over longer range. Okay, so from 0 to 9 inches, um, it is strength 10 AP1, heavy 1. It's basically an orbital bombardment without the blast template on a stick, which is pretty good. Um, quick thing to note, the rest of the weapons are blast, so if it's fired between 9 and 36 inches, the profile used is based on the distance to the central hole of the blast marker when it's placed before rolling for scatter. So like if you place it 35 inches away and then it scatters forward two inches, you are using the um, third up to oh no, sorry, better place the profile between nine and eighteen. So if you place it like sixteen inches away and it scatters another four, then you will still use the nine to eighteen profile because it's a different size blast template and you pick the profile. When it's placed not after it scatters because it could shaft you if you do it the other way around so in 9 to 18 inch mode it is strength a ap3 heavy one blast it is a crack missile with blast which is pretty handy i mean it's still got quite bad range um but it will do a lot of work for you and from 18 to 36 as in in the early game it is strength 6 ap5 heavy one large blast which is amazing at clearing out uh, light infantry things in cover Maybe not things in cover, but really good at clearing out light stuff. So it's pretty helpful. Um, the best profile I think is the mid-range one because you don't have to rely on ballistic skill as much. So if you do have to up your weapon skill using doctrinas, you're not going to be punished for it because this thing does also have doctrine imperatives. So you won't get punished because, well, you will get punished, but not as much as you would if you're firing the single shot mode. Uh, and it still has the AP3 blast template, which is pretty good. What else has it got? It has a broad spectrum data tether and a searchlight, as we talked about before. Uh, this is why, again, you don't need those enhanced data tethers, because if you've got lots of walkers, you just don't need them. And it also has an Emanatus force field. What that does is things. It gives that a 6 plus invulnerable save. Okay, so it's a 6 of invul on your walker. Not that bad, I guess. Uh, I'll take it. Which is okay. Um, it has Doctrine Imperatives, as I already mentioned, so if you are going to be using that short range profile, consider buffing its ballistic skill, but then you'll get charged because its range is terrible, and your weapon skill will go down even more. Um, but you don't really want to get into combat with this thing, it has one attack and initiative two. 
at strength five, so it's not going to do that much anyway. And model with it's also got the rule crawler. A model with this special rule is never slowed by difficult terrain and automatically passes uh, dangerous terrain tests. That's good, but it can't run. Not that you'd want it to run anyway with the massive great gun on this thing. And field harmonics. A model with this special rule adds one to any involved saves made for its Eminatus force field for each other model from the same squadron within four inches. So if you take a squadron of these things, that force field that was a six up gets better. You can include up to two additional dune crawls for 90 points a model. And that means that the best save they're going to get is a four plus. But that will only apply to the front one because the two at the back might be more than four inches away from each other. So they would only have five pluses. Just something to bear in mind. Um, it is expensive to do, but it will make them pretty hard to get rid of. I mean, a dreadnought, a dreadnought with a four up involved, followed by a dreadnought with a five up involved, followed by a dreadnought with a six up involved is pretty scary. Um, and any model may replace its eradication beamer with one of the following. Uh, either a twinling heavy phosphor blaster, a neutron laser and cognis heavy stubber, or an Icarus array. So the twinling heavy phosphor blaster is 15 points per model, meaning that it will take your dune crawler up to 105 points if you use it. I'm assuming it's in the phosphor section, which it is. And it is 36 inch range, strength 6, AP3, heavy 3, luminogen. Talked about luminogen once already in this episode, so it's pretty useful. Um, and it's got a good range, so if you're worried about the eradication beam, like you like that strength at AP3, but don't like the randomness of scatter or its lack of range, no problem. Just slap this on and you've got three basically mini rocket launchers with luminogen. So that's pretty good. I think it's pretty helpful. Um, 15 points to get that over an eradication beamer, unless you really need the 9-inch super last cannon on a stick, or you're fighting a lot of light infantry where the eradication beam would be useful. I'd say that's a fair swap. The Neutron Laser and Cognis Heavy Stubber set you back 25 points, so it, it does cost quite a bit. Now the Cognis Heavy Stubber, let's start with that, is 36 inch range of strength 4, AP6, Heavy 3 Cognis, so it's BS2 on Overwatch. Uh, that's pretty good, I mean, it sort of makes up for the fact that you aren't going to have that strength, it's AP5 Pie Plate for getting rid of Light Infantry-ish. And the Neutron Laser, ooh, don't do that, is a 48 inch range. Strength 10, AP1, Heavy 1, Blast, Concussive. Wow. Wow, that gun is good. So, yeah, this is basically an old bombardment on a stick. Uh, you don't have ordnance, and you lose a bit of blast power, but you can fire it every turn. Strength 10, AP1, Blast is really good. Like, this will deal with heavy tanks. It will just mulch heavy infantry. Uh, just drop this on Terminator Squad and watch your opponent cry. It, it's really nice, and if anything does survive it, for example, it's a monstrous creature that you're about to charge, well, it's initiative one now, so it, it's really, really useful. I've got to say, that's pretty good. Um, 25 points for that and the, and the stubber. Yeah, I'm not going to complain about that at all. And the final option is the Icarus Array for 35 points. If this is going to cost 35 points, it better be damn good. So what have we got? Uh, the Nicarus Array is a twin Icarus auto cannon with a built-in Gatling rocket launcher and a built-in Daedalus missile launcher. Okay, any or all of these weapons can be fired in the same shooting phase that almost shoot at the same target. What? If the twin Icarus auto cannon uses interceptor rule to fire in the enemy turn, the other weapons may still fire in your subsequent shooting phase and can be fired at different targets to those fired at by the twin Icarus auto cannon. Wow. Okay, so let's have a look at the guns. The Daedalus Missile Launcher is 48 inch range, strength 7, AP2, Heavy 1, Skyfire. So you're going to be shooting at BS1 at ground targets, which is pretty bad. Um, but it's, other than that, it's a plasma gun on a stick, uh, without gets hot and with a ton more range. The Gatling Rocket Launcher is 48 inch range, strength 6, AP4, Heavy 5, ignores cover, so that means ignores jink, Skyfire. Again, ground targets are an issue, but you are basically completely blasting every fly you see out of the sky, which is great. And the Twin Icarus Auto Cannon, 48 inch range, strength 7, AP4, Heavy 2, Interceptor, Skyfire, and also Twin Linked. Um, I think Interceptor allows you to fire at ground targets normally. Um, if it does, then that's, that's great. Um, if not, then so be it. This is basically the last word in how to kill a flyer. This is how to kill a flyer 101. Fire a rocket launcher at it, then fire five smaller rocket launchers at it, and then but they acknowledge its jink, which is the really awesome bit, and then fire two autocannon shots at it, which are twin linked. 
I think the really nasty one there is the rocket launcher, the Gatling rocket launcher, because it ignores cover. And Jink is a cover save. So if you're someone like an Orc bomber, you hate this thing. Basically, anything that's not a Heldrake hates that thing. Um, and while you don't have the super high strength of something like a Vendetta's Twin Glass Cannons, you've just got so many shots putting out that most flyers will go down. And if a flyer squadron comes in, for example, you can use the Icarus Auto Cannon to shoot in one turn, hopefully do some damage, and then use the Gatling Rocket Launcher and the Daedalus Missile Launcher to finish one off in your own turn. So yeah, that's really nice. Um, but you lose all ground-based firepower, pretty much. You pay 35 points to give up your ground-based weaponry. It's risky. Um, if you're facing like flying class on this, or you think you're going to be facing Tyranids, Necrons with a lot of flyers, something like that, then or something with a lot of reserves, because Interceptor is useful, then maybe you consider running the Icarus Array. Other than that, I don't think you need it. If you are going to run it, don't put it in a squadron, because it's basically going to lock your squadron to shooting at a flyer. Put it on its own and then run a second squadron consisting of something else. Um, it is competing for a heavy support slot with the Ballastari. Uh, they do do slightly different jobs though, so I wouldn't worry too much. And any Dune Crawler Matic items from Skitari Vehicle Equipment, which the other two can't do for some reason. So what's in the Skitari Vehicle Equipment list? Well, we have a Cognis Heavy Stubber, which gives you a bit more shooting fire, fire which is nice. I think that's really good to have. Smoke launchers, which you can't take if you have an Icarus array, um, which is fine because it would kind of not work law wise, and that's five points as well. The Mind Scanner probe for 10 points, and the Cognis Manipulator for 25. More stuff I have to look up. <laughs> right. Just get out of here to look up material. So, Mind Scanner probe. If a unit within six inches of a friendly model equipped with a Mind Scanner probe is charged, the charging models do not gain bonus attacks. However, if the target unit was already locked in combat from a previous turn or has gone to ground, the probe has no effect. This is nice if you've got a unit that's protecting your dune crawler that then has to take a charge for it. It's more likely to live because your opponent just basically lost a ton of attacks. That's really quite nice. Um, the other one was the Cognis Manipulator, which you paid 25 points for. Where is it? Um, do 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 do. Um, I think I've lost it, guys. Oh, no. I, no, I think I've lost it. I actually think I've lost the Cognis Manipulator. Do, 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 <sighs> Right. Come on. Where are you? I'm assuming you've paid 25 points for it. It's got to be good. Whatever it is. If I can find the bleeding thing. Oh, here it is. It's a melee weapon. Aha. Uh -huh. So it is a plus, it's a times two strength AP1 melee weapon that is unwieldy, which is fine because you need to have two anyway. It's a specialist weapon and it has the field repairs special rule. And what that does is it basically gives your dune crawler it will not die. Yeah. So it's a power fist that gives you it will not die for 25 points. Hmm. The basic question you want to ask yourself here is, do I want to pay 25 points for it will not die? Because you don't want to get your Dream Crawlers in melee. You have one attack at weapon skill 3. Even if you're buffing weapon skill, well, that's not what you want anyway, unless your entire army's in melee. Because you'll be dropping ballistic skill. So, is it that good? 25 points for it will not die? Debatably. I mean, with a squadron, when you've got the 4 of Invon save on, and it will not die. Yeah, that's nasty. But... You're paying the best, you're paying 300 points to do it. To give one vehicle it will not die and four of Invol save. The other ones are still going to pay another 50 points to get there, it will not die. So, I don't know. I mean, it's powerful, but not on a Dune Crawler because it has basically no offensive capability whatsoever. So, I'm not sure about that. I mean, it's alright, but it's hardly anything ridiculous. And that's basically it. That's all the vehicles. In the next episode, we're going to be taking a look at the one, two, three, four, four formations that you can get as part of your Skitari army. But let's just go over the units we've covered in today's episode first. The Sardinian Dragoons. These are pretty useful, um, both for combat and for shooting. I think they're better off at range because the Radium Jezails are really quite nice. The Rad Poisoning combined with Sniper is pretty powerful. And they're obscured as well, they get a 5 up cover save all the time. 
pretty good value. The Iron Strider Ballastari are better and worse than your Dragoons. If you need them for um, infantry killing, you're better off with Dragoons because they're A, cheaper, and B, just as good at it um, because they're sniper weapons. Um, but if you're wanting something that's a bit heavier, the Ballastari will do you good. Although I think the best loadout is with the Cognus Lads Cannon because that gives you some proper anti tank. The Dune Crawler, well, you can do a million different things with this thing. Uh, if you like the variety in weapons, the Eradication Beam is not a bad choice. The Phosphor Blaster is a really nice weapon. I think that's really good if you're fighting Space Marines. The Neutron Laser and Heavy Stubber gives you a nice mix of anti-infantry and anti-tank. Um, and the Icarus Array is just the last word in flyer killing. In terms of vehicle equipment you can take for that, because the other ones actually can't, I would recommend having a Cognitive Heavy Stubber extra, certainly can't hurt. Smoke Launchers... If you're not taking Nicarus Array, it can't hurt, just remember to do it. The Mind Scanner Probe is good if you've got units in the way that are like protecting your Dune Crawler. And the Cognis Manipulator is debatably good. I mean, it's 25 points to basically give your thing it will not die. I don't know how good that is. I think you've got to make that call yourself. And that is the end of today's episode. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to give it a like if you did, and any comments would be appreciated. As I said, next episode we're going to be covering the formations as well as my final thoughts on Codex Guitari. For now, though, that's all. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Michael for Tactic Imperialis. Until the next time, see you all again, folks. Bye for now.